So this is a typical conversation I had when John would come visiting and drop into my office. He'd ask me, so Gavin, what are you working on now? Well, I'd show him some of these things. <laughs> so there's these great things like called ineons, two-dimensional physics, don't have to follow the same specific exchange statistics in three dimensions. You can do like universal quantum computation, but we can also do like protective quantum memories. And I told him about grading operations and how you could actually implement this in physical systems. And he would just stare at me and just say, no. <laughs> We're not smoking your mire on us. Tell me something real. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about this. Um, quantum tricorder, um, which is something I would really like to play with. And this is just the, uh, the lovely visualization of what I hope is a future device that was, you know, largely inspired by the kind of work that John did on quantum sensors. So, you know, there's been a lot of investment now in quantum technologies, a lot in quantum computing, and you often hear, oh, but there's this nearer term possibility of having quantum sensors. And you don't need to do, you know, like the whole enormous overhead of fault tolerance to make these things work. So we should be seeing sensors any day now that actually use entanglement, but we don't. Why is this? Well, it's the same damn problem you have with quantum computers. There's noise all over the place and we don't know how to tame it. Uh, you gotta do entangled probe state preparation to actually get a state that could be useful for sensing. There's noise that affects that. Then you're accumulating a quantum signal. There's noise that happens during that. And there's many obvious cases you can check where your gain from entanglement is immediately lost just from one error. For example, you're using a GHZ state. And then there could be noise uh, just before the measurement stage, or maybe you screw up the measurement. And so it doesn't work. So I'm just gonna talk about uh, a couple strategies I've been looking at in this direction to make these things potentially work. It'll be in two parts. The first part is gonna be about the entangled probe state preparation. And this is work done with people in Macquarie, including Daniel Berggarth, who was in the back somewhere. There it is. Uh, Thomas Foltz, who's not here, and uh, Matthias and Nabo. Um, and then the second part is going to be some work that I've done recently with uh, Ying Kai Ouyang, who's uh, currently at CQT, but will be shortly moving to Sheffield. Okay, so if you don't want to pay attention to half of the talk, here's the too long to read. The idea is to um, start off with some easily prepared state, like at the bottom here. Um, maybe just all the spins are polarized. And uh, we're gonna look at using some ideas from geometric control theory to involve idea, uh, operations that will couple the spins to a bosonic mode in order to realize geometric phase gates, which will produce entanglement between the spins. At the same time, we're gonna do some dynamical decoupling to get around some of the dominant error sources, particularly spin dephasing. And then we'll do some more steps of this. And at the end, get to some target state, which is the highly entangled state of our spins, which is ready to do some sensing. And the particular kind of uh, scenario I'm considering is where we want to estimate the strength, call it eta here, of a field that arises from a rotation about the y-axis. Actually, this protocol will work for rotation about anywhere on the equator, but we'll still stick with the y-axis here. So the, you know, the, the estimation of precisionment, the precision estimation of this based upon using a measurement operator M has this uh, variance that goes like the ratio of the, the, the variance of the operator for that particular uh, value of parameter eta divided by the derivative of the expectation value of that operator. When the, when the expectation value is taken with respect to the state which is evolved according to this signal. So you could use n qubits to try to infer the angle. Just have a, you know, copies of n qubits. All of them do some little rotation. And if these are unentangled, then you have a, you know, the shot noise limits where precision of the estimation in a single shot goes like one over the square root of the number of 
probes you have. That's the standard quantum limit. But in the case of particular entangled states, you can achieve a standard deviation of your estimation that goes like one over a number of parts, the Heisenberg scale. In particular, um, I'm going to look at how you can do this using Dicke states. So Dicke states uh, for n qubits is in the maximal symmetric space. So in the talk that Steve Turner gave this morning, these would be the states if you had a bunch of qubits that would be all a single row. So then uh, in, in angular momentum, that means that the, the angular momentum of your n qubits is n over two, and there are n plus one states here described by these Dicke states, which are just evenly weighted superpositions over all the distinct permutations of strings with a given Hamming weight. So like the Dicke state D0 is the one with all zeros. D1 is this W state with a single excitation shared among the n qubits. And then that generalizes for an arbitrary Dicke weight sum over all these unique permutations. And then finally, the DNN state is the all one. In particular, like a GHC state would be just the superposition of DN0 and DNN. Well, okay, if you choose your observable to be JZ squared, then um, there's this formula for what the variance of eta is. And um, if you choose your initial Dicke state to be halfway up the ladder, so superposition over all the strings with half of them one, uh, at, the, at the minimum angle eta is zero, then you get uh, this Heisenberg scale. So this is the kind of target state we want to look for, this state in the middle of the ladder. Okay, well, there's been a lot of work actually in the past, and forgive me if I don't cite you, <laughs> if you've worked on this, I just want to give like a general, general idea of some of the schemes that have been considered before for making Dickey states. Um, so uh, there's a very recent paper just out from a few months ago, which looks at a quantum circuit construction um, where uh, you can achieve any Dickey state of Dickey weight W with order n times w gates, and uh, the best depth, assuming a maximally connected structure, uh, a graph is um, order w times log n over w. But it does require a universal gate set and addressability on all the qubits. Um, so there's already some restrictions put in there at how well you can control the system. Then uh, there's other ideas like adiabatic preparation. So maybe you uh, start off at the lowest Dicke state, all the strings in zero, and um, you apply some gates which allow you to walk one step at a time from the lowest rung in the ladder to the next one up, to the next one up, so forth, without doing multiple jumps so that you can control exactly how you make the amplitudes um, couple so that you get exactly the Dicke state you're targeting. But uh, these kinds of methods tend to have high constraints on the um, adiabaticity requirements so that you don't couple outside either the Dicke subspace or to the outside the target state you want to reach. And they don't scale very well. Uh, there's also some state selective methods you can use, for example, using dipole dipole interactions, but these tend to require very special geometries. And again, they can allow couplings which can take you outside the Dicke state. So we wanted to find something that would be more robust and also give us full control. So we're going to get some help from a boson. Um, then we will think about coupling our spins to some bosonic mode um, with Frisch annihilation operators A dagger and A. And uh, this doesn't have to be like an optical mode here. It kind of looks like you know, atomic spins in a cavity, but this could be like ions that are coupled to a motional mode or NB centers coupled to microwave modes, molecules coupled to an optical cavity. There's a lot of different possibilities. Um, and the control we're going to consider here is the ability to do displacement operators on the mode. Um, 
We will not need direct interactions whatsoever between the spins. And we're going to assume you have some dispersive coupling between the modes and the spins. So that's, uh, and it's, it's evenly weighted across the spins. So W is described by this Hamiltonian with some coupling strength G and then um, JZ is a Z component of solar angular momentum and then A dagger A is the number dagger. So that's a dispersive coupling. Okay, and the main ingredient we're gonna look at doing is uh, a geometric phase gate of this dispersive type. And it involves uh, quite a few steps. Let me just take you through a little cartoon here. Um, well, imagine we start off here on the uh, bottom left corner and we apply this operator R, which is just the unitary generated by uh, the dispersive shift and the, the angle here is determined by how long you let that interaction occur. And the sign can be changed by flipping the spins selected. So you have this dispersive interaction followed by a displacement. And here I'm picturing this in the phase space trajectory. So this is like, you know, one axis would be the Q coordinate of the boson and this Y axis would be the P coordinate. So you do this displacement, then let it do the dispersive interaction again, another displacement, opposite sign dispersive interaction, go backwards, another dispersive interaction, and then finally close the loop. And <coughs> you return to the initial point you were in phase space so that actually the mode returns to its initial state. Um, and it could be any state, it doesn't have to be the, the vacuum, it could actually start in a thermal state, it doesn't matter. Um, but the residual action is nonlinear on the spin. So you get this unitary that looks like the exponential of something involving the sine of JZ. So highly nonlinear. And uh, the parameters in this unitary, well, the theta parameter depends on how long you let it interact with the mode. The phi parameter is just the, the difference in the arguments of, so just really the angle here in the, the phase space. And then chi is uh, proportional to the area you projected in phase space. So just an illustration of how this works, let's consider an even number of spins. And we choose a trajectory that looks like this square. So we're looking at this kind of square trajectory. If you look at uh, the action on Dickey states where the weight is even, then you just follow along what happens. And um, the first step, you do displacement. Second step, nothing happens. Third step, another displacement. Fourth, nothing happens. Fifth, sixth, and seventh. So you form this, this square trajectory in phase space. Instead, if you look at the action on the Dickey states with odd weight, then <coughs> you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now it's a geometric phase gate. So the action is dependent upon the area tra traversed in phase space. But this area has a sign that's, you can think of it as given by the vector that points out of the page. Whereas this one has the sign determined by the vector pointing into the page. And so you actually get opposite signs for these two. And they're the same depending upon whether it's even or odd parity. So um, the net action then is given by this unitary, which <coughs> is an exponential involving the product of the Z operator. So it's a highly non-local gate. And in fact, with a single step of this, you could um, realize a GH3 state. So then we can look at what be required in order to achieve uh, control on the system in the Dickey space. So first we'll note that you can use this as a primitive for phasing a Dickey state. If I apply a sequence of uh, N over two of these types of geometric phase gates and choose the angles appropriately, then using the sum rule on the exponents, uh, just, just using the sums of cosines, or I choose my angles theta and phi correctly, um, I can achieve a case where I apply a phase on a single Dickey state with weight L. 
okay. And then, um, then what we can say is, okay, let's say we wanna do a unitary under the two phases. Well, we can write that in the spectral decomposition. So you just, you know, work out the, the eigenvectors, lambda k and eigenvalues of your chosen unitary on this space. And then um, we can rewrite the unitary in terms of a product of n minus one um, state preparations followed by phasing of a particular tricky state, like the uh, all zero state, and then un undoing those state preparations. So it's just another way to decompose unitaries where um, the, the spectral decomposition can be just done in terms of map the all zero state to a particular tricky state, phase it, and then unmap. And um, there's some freedom in your choice of these uh, state preparations. They can be any unitary extension of the map from the, the all zero state to your particular eigenstate. Now each of these state preparations can be achieved by doing uh, compositions of sticky state, uh, geometric phase gates and uh, collective rotations. And it can be done exactly. Uh, so the overall complexity for state synthesis is N geometric phase gates. And for unitary synthesis is five N squared over two. And it's, it's important to know that these are exact. So as opposed to certain other geometric phase approaches like the Momo Sorensen gates, which use the JZ squared type of effective Hamiltonians, uh, this gives you an exact prescription. All right, so how does this work with noise? Well, one of the first things that is certainly gonna be present is decay of the bosonic mode. So we have some decay at a rate kappa, and let's say our fundamental coupling strength, the dispersive coupling strength is at a rate G. Then um, it means you won't exactly form a closed trajectory. You'll have some decay. So one thing you can do is you can modify the displacement operators to account for that. You just modify the amount of displacement along the horizontals and verticals as you close the trajectory. And, uh, and then you can work out what the effective map on your system is when you include this decay. It turns out it gives you a highly nonlinear map on the spins, but nonetheless, you can compute it and work out what the process fidelity is for this whole operation. And um, what you find is that the, the process fidelity uh, for state preparation to say our target sticky state, which is in the middle of this ladder, uh, is, is lower bounded by this quantity uh, here. So it's, it's an exponential, something that involves the ratio of the decay rate to the fundamental interaction rate, and it scales like n to the one fourth. Um, so it's a very weak scaling with the number of spins. Uh, the particular reason for this scaling is because we can do something a little bit more clever in how we prepare this state. We can use ideas from amplitude amplitude. So, um, sorry, I'm using slightly different notation here for the Dickey states instead of the D and W states, I'm using the J, J M states. So J is N over two, which is the maximum single dimension state. And the second number refers to the M quantum number of the eigenstates of JZ. So if we were to start, let's say in an initial spin coherent state, which means you start with all the spins down and you do a pi halves rotation. And let's say we want our target state to be the Dickey state in the middle as before. Then um, actually, since we've already seen that you can perform a uh, phasing on a particular Dickey state, and we have the, the ability to prepare this initial state S that actually this looks a lot like the steps you get in a uh, Grover's type search algorithm. So you have um, uh, some initial state S, we want to get to a target state W here, which is the Dickey state in the middle of the ladder. And, and um, you just apply compositions are reflecting about W or reflecting about S. 
and um, but rather than going like the square root of the number of spins, since the number of states is n, um, we actually, it's faster than that because our initial overlap is larger. So in fact, the, the number of these kinds of Grover steps you need scales as n to the one four. Um, so overall, this gives you a complexity for doing the state preparation that goes like n to the five fourths, which is a little bit worse than it would be given the protocol I gave before, except the action angles you need to use in the geometric phase gates go like one over n versus order um, one in the other case. So using these two ideas together, you get uh, a fidelity which only scales very weakly with the number of spins. Okay, well, that covered the decay of the mode, but what about spin decoherence? Uh, so let's just assume we're in the regime where the dominant source of decoherence is spin decay. Now, you know, you should take that with a grain of salt, though, because these are Dicky states. And if you're familiar with the, the physics of these systems at all, um, Dicky states are those which can exhibit super radiance. So if you do have a a, a mechanism for spontaneous emission, then as you go up the Dickey ladder, you get amplification of the rate of decay. So we have to imagine that we're in a scenario where we're encoding in states which don't have a, uh, an intrinsic decay mechanism or that it's highly compressed. Um, but what we'll see is that for the spin dephasing noise, geometric phase gate has a kind of built-in robustness and that is because if you look at this trajectory here, two of these states where you're doing these evolution, where you couple the spins to the mode, have opposite signs from the other two. And those are related by a collective spin flip. So in fact, if the displacement operators are very fast, it's like you do interaction with the mode, spin flip, interaction with the mode, spin flip. This acts like a mechanism to echo out lower frequency uh, spin dephasing noise. So in fact, you can uh, work out what the filter function associated with this geometric phase gate is. Um, and uh, here I'm just looking at the y-axis is the filter function multiplied times the, uh, the, the square of uh, the uh, rate of decay or spin dephasing. And um, the the dashed lines are what you get without the dynamical decoupling that's built into these geometric phase gates. And the solid lines are with. So basically having a, uh, a low value of this filter function is good. That means you tend to uh, reduce the effect of noise on your system. Um, so let's just show how this actually exhibits itself. If we look at the performance of, say, a system of 70 spins, where um, we include the effects of global dephasing and, um, and also decay of the mode, then the fidelity error as a function of the decay rate of the mode divided by the coupling strength um, is shown here. So the solid blue line is where you have no dephasing and then the other, the other dashed lines are with some amount of dephasing, which is determined by the cutoff frequency of um, the bath, which we've assumed is only up here. So you can see that um, you can actually get quite good fidelities, even when the presence of dephasing, fidelity is errors of around you know, two parts in a thousand. Um, and then also you can look at the precision of your estimation based on the protocol. And um, the, the red line here is the kramer rao bound determined by the best measurement you could take in the no error regime. This upper line is this, the uh, shot noise limit. And so you certainly can be in a regime where you still get a quantum advantage, even with the presence of these two errors. And up here, the black line is just illustrating what would happen if you did all these steps, but you didn't have the dynamical coupling built in there. So there's a real improvement you get. 
for that. Okay, so we see there's a pathway at least to get the state. And then you could try to do some sensing with that. Um, and it didn't require a, a heck of a lot of control. It was all global operations and um, ability to, to couple it to this mode. So then the any addressability and no special tunable gate of a particular subset of spin. But let's see how we could actually meaningfully integrate this into uh, some kind of quantum sensing where we not only have noise during the preparation of the state, but maybe we want to, want to try to error correct that state afterwards so it performs better. And also maybe we want to handle noise during the accumulation of the signal. Well, it's been shown by several authors now that you can get in the quantum advantage from sensing if uh, you um, have only a constant number of bears without the need for quantum error correction. Now, it, it won't work for all states. Like I mentioned, the GHD state, you have uh, one dephasing error and you lose everything. You go from a superposition of all zeros and all ones to a mixture. You don't get any advantage. But for other states, you can get an advantage. In particular, for these Dickey states, if you have a single error, they'll still work. Um, but, uh, most channels do not have a constant number of errors. Um, you know, they often have a linear number of errors. Um, and interestingly, I'll discuss this a little bit later, to reach Heisenberg scaling uh, with a precision, a precision when you have a linear number of errors, then um, if the quantum error correction doesn't correct away the signal, the span of the errors must not lie within the signal. Um, so uh, that puts a real constraint on what you could do if you're in a realistic situation where you have a linear number of errors. Um, but we'll see that you can relax the assumption on this statement to actually still get something that will work in practice. Okay, so let's look at actually throwing in error correction here. And for this, I'm gonna look at what are called GNU codes. Uh, this thing, uh, well, if you ever played with Linux, like old Linux was, it was the, the GNU. GNU is also a wildebeest. And if you don't want to read Linux books, then look up YouTube videos on wildebeest. There's some, some fun videos there, fighting with lions and so forth. Um, and um, these codes were introduced by Ying Kai uh, quite a while ago now, like 2014. And uh, what they look like, there's a, here, there's these, this ZNU actually stands for some parameters that define the code. So they involve superpositions over these Dickey states um, where the weights are given by um, these binomially distributed amplitudes. So in one of them, you have uh, the zero, logical zero involves sums over uh, even weighted Dickey states and the one is sums over odd weighted Dickey states. Um, and so the, the parameters here, the G in GNU stands, stands for the bit flip distance, N stands for the phase flip distance, and mu is a scaling number, which is some real number, and the total number of qubits, capital N is G times N times U. Um, these codes are particularly robust to deletion errors which are erasure errors at unknown locations. So many codes are not robust to such errors. Um, when would this happen? Well, I mean, it can certainly happen in the photonic system where you just had an absorption event, you don't know the photon was absorbed. Um, or it could be, you know, in some trapped atomic system where maybe you don't have the ability to resolve where an error occurred, but you know an error occurred somewhere. And um, in fact, in many systems, uh, erasure errors can dominate. So for example, it was shown recently by the group of Jeff Thompson uh, that in um, Rydberg atom registers, up to 98% of errors can be converted into erasure errors. 
which is a nice thing. So if you're, you know, following our correction, uh, you know that there are certain codes which work very well for erasure errors. And so you can think about, you know, concatenated codes where you have one that's mainly focused on dealing with erasure errors and a second layer which handles other kinds of poly errors. Um, so actually we're gonna look at something, a slight deviation of these GNU codes called GNU's codes, <laughs> shifted, shifted new codes. Um, so uh, these have a nice visualization. So it just involves, uh, you know, do some shift here on the weights. And so like the logical zero here would be the, the red indicated by the states with weights on these red um, weights and um, logical one is with the blue. And the distance G here is just the gap between these two. So if you're familiar at all with uh, binomial codes in bosonic systems, there is an analogy here, except we're working in a symmetric based sense. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. You've got a comb of states for one state and a shifted comb for the other state. The, the logical operators, are they're transversal, but they're not Clifford. So uh, the logical X is just a poly X on all the spins, but the logical Z is phasing, but with an angle that looks like pi over two G, where G is this parameter in the GNU code. Okay, so how do you make use of these for sensing? Well, uh, We'll start off preparing a, a logical plus state. And um, that can be prepared using the technique I described in part one. And let's say we accumulate a signal that's going to be generated by the JZ operator. Um, and then we'll measure in the plus minus logical basis. And you can compute the, the variance of your estimate here. Um, this function, it looks like this. So um, this, this axis here is the Fisher information uh, divided by G squared N, which is actually the quantum Fisher information. That's the best we could do over any measurement. And um, so the, the one here means you've exactly got two SI. Um, and then for different choices of G and N, you get you know different performances here but notice that there's a regime, there's a, you know, a reasonably large range of thetas such that you can have a fish information that's up to a constant equal to the quantum fish information. And um, the quantum fish information itself, um, you can choose the G and the N so that this goes like uh, N squared, which would give you the Heisenberg scale. All right, well, what are we gonna do about errors though? So I've assumed everything is in the symmetric space, but errors aren't gonna assume that. They'll take us out generically. So again, thanks Pete <laughs> for introducing a little bit of this notation. So we, we can analyze the, the effective errors using a Schur-Weil duality. Um, so the, the Hilbert space of n qubits is um, also described in terms of a direct sum over Young diagrams D, and with a tensor spot product space over symmetric young tableau and semi standard young tableau. All right, so what are all these things? Well, we you know, go back to the 19th century and uh, look at our group theory books. So, a young diagram is an object that looks like this. In the case of qubits, it only has at most two rows, uh, q dits that could have D. Um, and if the first row is always longer or equal to the second row, and the sums of the boxes in those two rows is equal to n, the number of qubits. So whatever the shape is defines the Young diagram. The uh, filling in of the boxes determines what's called a standard Young tableau. And uh, the rule here is that um, there's increasing along the uh, horizontal direction and also increasing along the vertical direction. Now, the actual Young diagram you're in is completely determined 
by the observable j squared. j squared is a total uh, squared angular momentum for all the spins. Uh, this particular standard Young tableau is determined by collective angular momentum of subsets of spins. So like the first spin, which I call J1. Yes, that little thing is running. Now we're working on off. Um, okay, yeah. So J squared one just means J squared for first spin. J squared two means J squared for spins one and two. J squared K means J squared for spins one through K. Um, so those, those values will determine what that semi or the standard Young tableau is. And then the final one, this semi standard Young tableau is an ordering like this, where you can just have to have it non decreasing as you go along the row and it has to increase along columns. Um, and those states are just determined by the operator JV. So, how might we perform error correction? in the space of errors that take us outside the Dickey space. Well, first off, uh, we want to determine this, this Young diagram and the standard Young tableau. So we need to measure J squared among all the spins and then successfully increasing subsets of the spins. Um, the ne next thing we wanna do is we want to measure uh, JZ, which will tell us if we've shifted. So if, if our logical states have shifted, for example, due to an amplitude damping event. Um, but we don't want to distinguish which logical state we're in. So what we need is actually to measure JZ modulo G. G is the gap between the logical zero and the logical one. So you know, if you've worked at all with uh, G states, P states, and those kinds of codes, you're familiar with measuring modulo some separation between your code words. It's the same kind of idea here. Um, and then once you do those measurements, you need to do a way to do correction. There's various options for correction, but um, I'm just gonna describe one of the easiest ones to describe, which is by teleportation. Um, but uh, before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about how one actually could do those measurements. Um, how would you measure total angular momentum? Well, I don't have this problem solved. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, if anyone in this room has any good idea on how to measure total angular momentum, I'm very happy to hear it. Um, you would think it would be a, something that had been discussed a lot. Uh, it's not actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you learn it for like two spins. That's where a total spin one, total spin zero. But uh, measuring J squared for many spins is just not something that's not concretely described. Yeah, that's right. I don't want to eat my spins up. Yeah. Yeah, but that'll, that'll screw it up, right? Because then you'll be. Um, for J squared, I mean, so I could do like a, I could do a sure transform. That'll certainly work. The scaling is like N to the four for that. So yeah, I was trying to think of something more dramatic. So yeah, certainly you could write down a circuit with. Yeah, but I started off in the maximal space. Yeah, so everything was all already maximal J. What's that? Two minutes, oh my God, okay. All right, so this is the hack way to do it. Just say, I got a couple of bosons to it so that I perform a displacement operation on the bosonic mode that depends on J squared. In which case, you know, if you start in the vacuum, it'll push the mode out, you can measure and then infer what J is by detecting on the mode. How would you do a modular measurement of JZ? Well, you could use a dispersive interaction between the spins, JZ, 
again, times a dagger a. And if you start off in a displaced, a vacuum state, this will just give you these blobs in phase space. You measure, and that gives you the modular measure. And then here's how you could do teleportation. So the idea is you've got your, your state, which has been corrupted. Maybe it's gone outside the Dickey space. But you have, uh, you have already prepared a, a good logical plus state. So you perform a, a control not gate between the, the ancillary resource and your corrupted state, do a modular measurement, and then um, do a classically determined correction on the um, ancillary state. The control not gate uh, is something that can be done again with the assistance of a bosonic mode where we uh, perform basically a controlled displacement operator in the mode that depends upon the parity of the weight of the Dickey state um, of your ancilla. And then combining that with the early other geometric steps in the geometric phase gate, you can get a, a conditional flip on this target state. Um, so that's the way you can do this teleportation. Uh, and so these are the results for doing quantum error correction um, in that case. So the, the x-axis here is the number of spins, the y-axis is um, the, the log of the variance, which basically just says if we get two, then we're getting Heisenberg scaling. And if it's one, it's shot scaling. So solid lines are with error correction, dash lines are without. And um, this is for some one, one type of error, just a single error. This, this one red line here is when you have a square root number of errors. Um, so even with a square root number of errors, you can get an improvement. But like I said, we really want to look at what happens if you have a linear number of errors. So I'll try to briefly speed up. Um, there's a, an important no-go result that was shown by these two papers. That is, if you want to do error correction while you're doing sensing, um, then if the Hamiltonian which generates the signal lies in the linear span of the error op jump operators associated with your noise channel, uh, then if you apply error correction arbitrarily fast and arbitrarily well between infinitesimal signal and noise evolution, then it turns out the standard quantum limit cannot be surpassed. That's pretty bad because it's very typical to have the Hamiltonian line in the span of those errors. Like, you know, for example, if you just have poly noise and, you know, if your signal involves sums of polys, you're screwed. Uh, and the proof involves a reduction from having n probes, which would be part of an error corrected uh, probe, you know, some probe which uses redundancy, uh, over a sensing time t over n, to equivalent to describe a serial type of uh, sensing where you have a single probe sensing over a time t. But uh, because actually getting an optimal Fisher information or quantum Fisher information for this scenario of all this quantum control with this noise is very difficult to do exactly. An assumption was made in these proofs that you can take the continuum limits uh, by applying error correction infinitely frequency as the best strategy to ameliorate your errors. Um, and that assumption is compatible with quantum error correction not degrading the signal. But we asked the question, what if you do quantum error correction that does slightly degrade the signal but you don't take this continuum limit. That is, you apply the error correction at your sublinear rate with respect to the number of qubits. Uh, well, I'm not gonna have time to go through this, but it turns out that there is a nested kind of protocol you can use um, where you adapt the, the temporal spacing between error correction steps, uh, which does not meet the assumption of these no-go theorems and can still get you to a quantum advantage regime that is better than standard quantum um, uh, so basically, th there's the Q is, is basically a power which determines how frequently you're doing error correction. And um, um, C is a parameter which tells you about what is your uh, amount of knowledge of the uh, signal that you've accumulated during these adaptive steps. And so it turns out that there is a regime where you can certainly get a quantum advantage that asymptotes to Heisenberg scaling.
uh, but you're not going to touch this here. So I'll just finish that um, you can use geometric control for quantum sensing to prepare entangled states, and that quantum error correction can be integrated into this to allow sensing even during errors, and the control is not too heavy. All right, thanks.